Behind the Scenes of World War II Text of Address by V.T. Hotef, Minister of D. Seventh-day Adventists, Sabbath, January 18, 1947, Mount Carmel Chapel, Waco, Texas. I shall read from Mount of Blessings, beginning with the second paragraph of page 181. Quote, the sin that leads to the most unhappy results is the cold, critical, unforgiving spirit that characterizes Pharisaism. When the religious experience is devoid of love, Jesus is not there. The sunshine of his presence is not there. No busy activity or Christless zeal can supply the lack. There may be a wonderful keenness of perception to discover the defects of others, but to every one who indulges this spirit, Jesus says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. He who is guilty of wrong is the first to suspect wrong. By condemning another, he is trying to conceal or excuse the evil of his own heart. It was through sin that men gained the knowledge of evil. No sooner had the first pair sinned than they began to accuse each other. And this is what human nature will inevitably do when uncontrolled by the grace of Christ. When men indulge in this accusing spirit, they are not satisfied with pointing out what they suppose to be a defect in their brother. If milder means fail to make him do what they think ought to be done, they will resort to compulsion. Just as far as lies in their power, they will force men to comply with their ideas of what is right. This is what Jews did, what the Jews did in the days of Christ, and what the church has done ever since, whenever she has lost the grace of Christ. Finding herself destitute of the power of love, she has reached out for the strong arm of the state to enforce her dogmas and execute her decrees. Here is the secret of all religious laws that have ever been enacted, and the secret of all persecution from the days of Abel to our own time. End quote. Now, for what are we in need of praying? That we cease criticizing others and get closer to Christ and receive His grace. Never yet have I seen a father or mother criticize his or her children. When parents hear others criticizing their offspring, then the critics get into trouble. But those same defendants of their own sons and daughters often criticize others with the idea that they do it for the good of the ones they criticize. If, they, if it actually does do a person good to be criticized to others, then pray tell me why the critics do not give their children some of the same good medicine. Let us pray for the grace of Christ to enable us to treat others as we would have them treat us, rather than keep ourselves in sin by finding fault with other people's practice of religion. Nahum's Prophecy This afternoon... We are to study the book of Nahum. The burden of this entire book, three chapters in all, is concerning two separate people. To ascertain who these people are, we shall begin with chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 18. Quote, chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Koshite. And chapter 3, verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust of uh, thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. End quote. Plainly, Assyria with her capital city, Nineveh, are the one people. Now to find who the other people are, we shall read from chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and 15, omitting that part of the verses which pertain to Assyria. Quote, 
Thus saith the Lord, Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. End quote. The people whom God has afflicted by their dispersion, and whom he promises to afflict no more, to break the Assyrian yoke from off their shoulders, are his people, those of his church. They, then, are the other people. The title of God's people, you note, is Judah. They are compelled to behold the messenger of God, who at the fulfillment of this prophecy brings them good tidings of peace, the message of the kingdom of peace. The Lord counsels them to be honest with God, honest in their profession of faith. She is assured that the wicked shall no longer be found in her midst, that they shall be removed by destruction. Thus are the wicked raptured away. So it is that while Nahum predicts liberation and peace for God's faithful people, he predicts predicts disaster for Assyria and for the wicked in the church. Three verses of chapter 2 will suffice to show the fate of Assyria. Nahum chapter 2, verses 6, 10, and 13. Quote, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the time of the smoke. Sorry, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off the prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. End quote. Here the prophet predicts that Assyria's capital city will be emptied, and her palace dissolved. Clearly then, the kingdom of Judah is set up in time of war and turmoil. What additional signs will mark the time? Let us read from chapter 2, uh, Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Quote, The shield of his mighty men is made red, the valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariots shall rage in the streets, they shall jostle one against another in the broadways. They shall seem like torches, they shall run like the lightnings. End quote. Obviously, this chapter meets its fulfillment in the day when the chariots are with flaming torches when they run like lightning, when they jostle one against another in the highways and in the broadways. That is the time concerning which the prophet was directed to write. And what other period can that be but the one in which we are living? The period in which vehicular traffic is geared to unprecedented speed, in which everything on wheels jostles one against another, both in the streets and in the countryside. Now, in view of the fact that we are living in such a period as described by Nahum, together with the fact that the preparations for Nahum's war are made during the time of such lightning like, tr lightning like travel, the truth clearly stands out that Nahum's prophecy is to meet its fulfillment in our day, and that the Assyria of this prophecy therefore is not ancient Assyria but another power that exists in the time of the end, Daniel 12, verses 9 and 10. Moreover, since God's people are by the fall of Syria to be liberated, and since from then on the wicked will no longer pass through their midst, the truth is clinched that all these things which Nahum predicts come to pass in the time of the purification of the church. Nahum chapter 2, verse 1, quote, 
He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munity, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. End quote. Here we plainly see that the one who dashes in pieces and who comes before a serious face is the one who makes his war preparations while the chariots are with flaming torches, with burning headlights, and while they run like lightning, as it were. The war activities of he that dashes in pieces compels Assyria to fortify her power mightily. Yes, the war started by this warrior is a war which begins the fall of Assyria. It may be interesting to know what happens to the one who dashes in pieces after Assyria prepares herself mightily. Let us read Nahum chapter 2 verse 5. Quote, He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make host haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. End quote. His worthies, his generals, shall stumble in their walk. That is, they make a mistake as they march on in hope of victory. In view of their disastrous blunder, and the fact that he that dasheth in pieces is mentioned uh, no more in Nahum's book, it is evident that he loses the war. Nevertheless, according to the verses that follow, in the chapters of Nahum, the fall of Assyria is certain. The one that dasheth in pieces only starts Assyria's fall. Now the question arises, if Assyria is to fall, and if the one that starts the war, the he that dasheth in pieces, is himself to lose out first, then what? Then at whose hands is Assyria to fall and be punished out of the land of Israel. For the answer, let us turn to Isaiah chapter 31, where this same Assyria is brought to view. Isaiah chapter 31, verses 6 to 8. Turn ye unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which their own hands have made unto you for a sin. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited. End quote. Again, we see that Assyria is to fall and be devoured, but not by the sword of a mean man, now the fact that God's people are admonished to turn unto him against whom ancient Israel revolted shows again that inspiration is speaking to modern Israel, to God's people in the Christian era. Verse 7, quote, For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. End quote. Obviously, the prophet is looking down the stream of time to a time of which a thorough reformation, a time in which only those who forsake every sin and embody truth and righteousness will be among those who turn to the Lord. None others will then be found in the congregation of the Lord. Verse 8, quote, Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword not of a mean man shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited. End quote. The Assyrian is to fall because of his wickedness, and because God's land must be yielded to the people of God. This will be done only when God's people turn unto him. Verse 9, quote, And he shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his Princes shall be afraid of the ensign. Thus saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. End quote. All this shall overtake Assyria as soon as God's people possess the land. What is the Lord's fire in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem? 
The answer is found in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Quote, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who shall abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. End quote. The prophecy of Isaiah, along with the prophecy of Malachi, makes the subject very simple. According to these prophecies, the headquarters of the gospel during the judgment for the living, and while the first fruits, the servants of God, the 144,000, stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion, shall be in Zion and Jerusalem. Now we ask, what is the overall purpose of Nahum's prophecy? It is to give God's people an understanding of the signs of the times, to make them aware of their duty, and to inform them of the fate of the wicked in their midst. Indeed, Nahum's prophecy clearly identifies God's people of today and modern Assyria. It shows the liberation of the former and the fate of the latter. It reveals that although the one who begins to bring about the fall of Assyria himself falls first, yet Assyria eventually falls, but not by the sword of a mean man, and that by this fall of Assyria is brought about the liberation of God's people. The wicked are destroyed from their midst. Most important of all, though, Nahum plainly shows that all these things take place in our day, and that the fall of Assyria will take place only after God's people turn fully to him. A great revival and reformation that is called forth through him who publisheth peace, Nahum chapter 1 verse 15, must first take place. We should, therefore, understand the signs of the times, perform our vows unto God, keep our solemn feasts, and do everything that is necessary in order to be found righteous, ready to escape the doom of the wicked, and to march on to the kingdom. Summary of Nahum's Prophecy by the Publishers 1. Two people are brought to view, the church and a nation comparable to ancient Assyria. 2. God's people, Judah, are counseled to behold the messenger of God, who at the fulfillment of this prophecy brings them good tidings of peace, of the kingdom of peace. 3. The prophecy is fulfilled in the day of unprecedented vehicular speed, the day when chariots with flaming torches jostle one against another in the broadways, unquestionably in our day. 4. In this day, he that dasheth in pieces wars with this modern Assyria. He begins Assyria's downfall. 5. Assyria fortifies her power mightily after her enemy comes before her face. 6. On the march to victory, her enemy, he that dasheth in pieces, makes a mistake and consequently falls, loses the war. 7. Assyria, nonetheless, later falls too, but not by the sword of a mighty man, not by the sword of a mean man. 8. The war, the fast rolling chariots, and a revival and reformation such as the world has never seen are signs of the fulfillment of Nahum's prophecy. 9. When God's people cast aside all their idols, fully turn to him, then it is that Assyria falls, then it is that the wicked are removed from the midst of the people of God. The Assyrian yoke is broken, and the servants of God, evidently the first fruits, the 144,000, stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion. For a detailed study of the book of Nahum, read tract number 14, War News Forecast.